In this video, we're going to look at community ecology. Remember that communities are groups of populations in a certain area. And directly or indirectly, these communities, these coexisting populations, will always interact. And these interactions will in turn shape the community to which these populations belong. Let's look at five factors that shape the structure of a community. One are the abiotic factors climate, topography, which dictate the temperature, the rainfall, and the soil types. Another factor is the kinds and amounts of foods and other resources that become available during the year and influence which species can live there. Three, individuals of species have adaptive traits that allow them to survive and exploit specific resources in a habitat. The species will interact in the habitat in competition, in predatory relationships, and also in parasitic or mutualistic relationships. And finally, the community structure is influenced by the overall pattern and actual history of changing population sizes and the arrival and disappearance of species and physical disturbances to the habitat. These five factors shape the community structure. In this video, we're going to discuss how these interactions uh, affect individual populations and groups of populations, and how habitat is not the same as niche, and how um, <clears throat> the structures of the populations can change over time uh, due to these interactions. Let's start with the concept of habitat. Habitat is the physical and chemical surroundings a species lives in. Now, we can see a habitat here, but what we don't see here is what we refer to as the term niche. And often people use the word niche to mean habitat, but it's an incorrect term, or an incorrect way to use that term. The niche is not just where an organism lives, but what it does in that, um, in that habitat. It's the sum of all the activities and relationships uh, in which an individual engages to secure and use resources necessary for its survival and reproduction. So it includes where it lives, but also kind of what role um, that organism uh, takes in that in that habitat. Kind of how they fit, um, how they fit in amongst all the other organisms that live there. Now we have two other terms to look at with niche. Uh, the term potential niche and the term realized niche. And the potential niche is the um, is what would happen in the absence of competition. What roles uh, and what space would an organism or species fill if they had no competition uh, for the resources that were available? And then, of course, the realized niche is what really happens, where that population ends up fitting uh, after it has to kind of compromise at times and acquiesce to competition from other populations in the area. Now this is best understood by looking at a picture. So here we have a diagram showing uh, two different species of some kind of barnacle and the fundamental niche or the potential niche uh, is shown by these arrows here. And so uh, this top barnacle, the smaller barnacle, in the absence of competition would fill this entire area from the high tide mark to the low tide mark. But however what we see is that this species of barnacle does not occupy this entire area. In fact, its realized niche is much more limited um, just to this top area because there's competition between it and this other population. And in this case, the other population is kind of squeezing it out of its fundamental niche into a much smaller realized niche. Let's look at a couple other kind of schematic diagrams to show this, this concept. Um, here we have some diagrams that show the FN is showing the fundamental niche and the RN is the realized niche and this air, um, where this L is some limiting factor that limits them to this part of the fundamental niche. And you can see it can get more complex with more species involved and then there's some areas in here that are blacked out and we'll talk about that because in those areas where the niches are overlapping um, we're gonna have some pretty harsh competition which is gonna direct how the species interaction um, plays out. Let's move on to types of interactions. 
Here we can see six categories of interactions that have different effects on population growth. We have neutral relationships, which by definition have no effect. Then there are commensalistic relationships. Realism relationship, one organism benefits directly and the other species isn't helped nor harmed. Let's look at some examples. Here we have barnacles on a whale and the barnacles uh, benefit from that. The whale's not harmed nor helped. Um, we have these the little fish that fall around the sharks and pick up the scraps, uh, gaining benefit from the job that the big shark has done, but providing no benefit to the shark. And these clownfish uh, get in and amongst these anemone tentacles where other fish can't go because they'll get stung, and for some reason the clownfish are immune to those stings. And so the clownfish uh, get shelter and protection, but the sea anemone gets no benefit, but is, al is also not harmed by the process. The next one is uh, mutualism. This is situations where we have a win-win uh, or a cooperative effect. Let's see some examples of mutualism. Here we have these birds. They're eating the ticks and fleas off of this antelope or gazelle or whatever it is, and uh, they're both benefiting. The uh, gazelle is getting rid of parasites, and the birds are getting food. Uh, the often we see this mutualism between plants and their pollinators. Here's a picture of um, these nodules on the roots, and inside these nodules are bacteria that are nitrogen fixing. Uh, the bacteria get a place to live, and the uh, plant gets um, nitrogen in a form it can use. And this, of course, is a lichen, and lichens are an example of an organism that shows mutualism because it's the relationship between a green algae and a fungus, um, both providing something valuable to the other. Our next uh, category is interspecific competition. Inter means between specific species. Competition between species, which by definition is disadvantageous to both. And the reason why it's disadvantageous to both is that the time and energy they spend competing with each other is wasted. Uh, they could be used using that time or energy to be finding food. And so fighting up against each other kind of cuts down on the uh, kind of efficiency of their energy use. What's interesting is that we don't see as much interspecific competition, or it certainly isn't as robust as the competition within species, and that's because we don't have as much overlapping niches. They're not fighting for the exact same resources, so they're not, they're not in competition directly as much. All right, uh, predation. Of course, predation is predators. Uh, here we have predators, and here we have a predator. And we're going to come back to this page in a little while and talk about what we, why these graphs are on here and what this might mean. But obviously in a predator relationship, uh, we know that one uh, organism is feeding on the other. And that can then um, certainly affect the relationship and have an effect on population growth. Uh, actually, we might as well go ahead and just look at this now. If we look at this graph, we see that as the prey population rises, uh, then the predator population can rise also because there's more prey for it to feed on. But as the predator population grows, they start to get very good at preying on the prey, or predating on the prey, and then the prey population drops. And as the prey population drops, it can't sustain as many of the predators. And you see this kind of um, population of one kind of following the other, and the predator will usually be lagging behind or should be lagging behind the population of the prey. This is some real data down here taken from a study, um, a historical study that's kind of pretty famous in this uh, the study of predator-prey populations. And the final category is that of a parasite. Uh, in the parasite relationship, uh, one of the organisms benefits while the other is harmed. Um, uh, and of course we could think of things like uh, ticks and mosquitoes, but also if like fungal growths. Um, there are certain plant parasites as well. Um, uh, fungus parasites and, and certain bacteria parasites also. Now, notice the word symbiosis here. This is a term that's used incorrectly a lot of the times. Uh, people use the word symbiosis when maybe specifically they should be saying mutualism. Symbiosis, sim means together and bios to live. So commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism are all forms of symbiosis, but obviously there's kind of a different um, equation in each one in terms of who's being helped and who's being harmed. And one last thing I might point out on this page is that we talk about predators and we think of um, something killing something else, but um, not always does the predator have to kill the the prey. We can think of animals or insects predating on a 
on a plant where they might eat parts of it but not kill it. Um, and also parasites uh, can def don't always kill their host. Uh, certainly a mosquito doesn't necessarily kill its host um, or uh, a tick. But the difference in these two um, relationships is that in the pr parasite relationship, the organism actually takes up residence on the host, um, but in predator relationship, they do not. I'm going to stop there and end part one of our community ecology video. Uh, come back for part two.